Working in, in Major League Soccer, I know that the players just had their offseason, but I'm curious what an offseason looks like for a referee. Do you even have an offseason? I'm sorry, what's an offseason? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, typical, just like the players, you know, we don't have much of an offseason, especially in Major League Soccer. Uh, with, with the Cup just happening, what seems like yesterday, uh, we're already ramping up. We have preseason camp next week, so we uh, really don't have much of an offseason, uh, and if it is, it's a blink of an eye. Uh, well, congratulations on being the first American to officiate in a, a World Cup final. An absolutely incredible honor. Now that you've had kind of some months uh, to reflect on that experience, what was your what was your biggest takeaway? Ooh. Australia New Zealand was amazing. Just to have the opportunity to be at that event was a huge career accomplishment, but then to be awarded the final was incredible. Um, I don't know that I've really taken a second to reflect on it, to be honest. We've just run right into the next thing, and I don't know that that's a bad thing. I think um, we've gotten a little taste of what success feels like, and now as a team, we're hungry for the next one, and we're, we're ready to, to chase the next uh, mountain. Okay, so what's the next mountain? <laughs> what, what are what are some of the, the goals as a, a referee? What are you working yeah. towards? Absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the one that is far off in the distance is certainly aspirational for us is, is 26. I mean, if you're not hungry for 26 in this country as a part of the game in soccer, uh, you're not paying attention because it's going to be <laughs> wild. There's certainly lots between now and then. We've got a lot to work towards. Uh, just this season, we have such an exciting season in MLS getting started. Uh, there's more attention and eyes on the league than ever before, and we're so excited for the opportunities we'll be announcing in Major League Soccer this year, which will be new. So there's a lot of pressure on us, and we're excited for the challenges. Of course, Copa America is coming. We've got the Olympics this summer. We've got the Women's Gold Cup. So that's just the front half of the year. So there's a lot to look forward to. Um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about being, being a woman in a male-dominated arena. Um, I mean, as a woman working in, in sports, I know like the level of preparation that I feel like I have to do, not to, to compensate, but in order to be sort of taken more, more seriously. As you've kind of ascended in your career, does that become less of something that you're thinking about in your prep? You're just a referee. You're just, you're just there. Or is it still something that's, that's front of mind? When I walk out in the soccer field, I don't think people still accept me as just a referee. I think I'm still a bit foreign for a long time. Um, I think we have a lot of growth still as it respects to uh, women in sports across the arena. Um, like you said, there's probably a lot of prep, extra prep that you have to do in your discipline, and there's no difference for me. Uh, we have physical demands. I have to meet the same physical fitness tests that my male counterparts do. A lot of them don't have to do half the prep that I do in order to meet those standards. And I'm happy to meet those standards because that's what's required to compete at this level and to keep up with the game. So um, we accept that as part of what we do. But I would definitely say there's less room for error. And I think that is a challenge that we have accepted and we have embraced. Um, and there's a lot of work that we put in. The difference between me prepping for a game and my husband prepping for a game is night and day. I will spend hours doing research on all the players and their backgrounds. Um, he's been in the league for 15 years, so it's a little easier for him. Um, but certainly there's a lot more work that I probably put in from a comparable standpoint, both from the technical aspect, but also the physical aspect. Um, there's a huge amount of effort that we put in just to make sure we can maintain the, the minimum standards. What's the best part about your job? The people. The people that I've gotten to meet and connect with. I mean, working internationally, I have friends all over the globe, and it's been an, an amazing experience to get to know people that are very different than us, that live in very different circumstances. Sometimes I think we have obstacles, and then I realize in the United States just how blessed we are, and uh, there's a lot of obstacles that everybody has to face in this game, and it's amazing to get to know the people. And, um, you know, we were just in Saudi Arabia for the Club World Cup, and um, it was an amazingly enriching cultural experience for me, um, and it broke down a lot of barriers that I maybe put up myself. Myself. So um, this, the game of soccer has given us so many amazing experiences and I've gotten to travel the world. This begs a question I want to ask you about the implementation of, of VAR because I feel like it's something that we end up talking about a lot on, on our show. And as somebody who's sort of entrenched um, in, this, in this world, where are you at with, with the level of VAR at, at this point? And how do you see it as something that ultimately is going to, to help the game and make your job as a, a referee easier? 
Yeah, we have some of the best referees in the world in Major League Soccer. We have several World Cup final referees in our, our arsenal of officials. We have some of the best of the best. That doesn't mean we're not going to make mistakes, right? And while we hold ourselves to a very high standard on the pitch, we're going to make mistakes. It's part of what we do. And uh, VAR has been a tool that has been valuable for us on the field because we're just one person in the middle of the field. And while we fight to get the right angle and we fight to get it right, we don't always. And we've seen that, you know, and the last thing we want to do as an official is affect a game by an incorrect decision. So VAR is a tool that allows us to get it right at the end of the day. And I think uh, we've seen across the board where everyone is accepting, especially in Major League Soccer, the technology and we're embracing it um, and we're welcoming it in. And I think VAR is an excellent tool for us to be able to make sure that we get the decisions right on the field, on the day, and we don't impact at the end of the day the outcome. Tori, thank you so much for the time. I, I hope you get some, some rest after this and uh, I hope your daughter wins her game today. <laughs> Thank you very much. Maybe she'll get that goal eventually. Thank you so much, Tori. Cheers. Yeah. Such a boss, Tori Penso. Do you know who else is a boss? Christina Uncle, who is joining us from, okay, I mean, you win. You win for backdrop. <laughs> Good grief. Where are you, lady? Oh, lady, I am in the home of football. I am in FIFA in Zurich uh, talking about uh, Diploma of Law and Football. Uh, championing the cause for Tampa Bay Sun Football Club, the women's professional soccer, and learning all the initiatives that they're doing here for women and girls in sports all over the world. Amazing. Well, I want to wish you a very happy International Girls and Women in Sports Day. You are one of my sporting heroes, Christina Uncle. Yeah. Uh, we just showed this interview that I did with, with Tori Penso, and we had a great conversation just about her kind of journey and, and the challenges she faces, but also the advancements that we've seen with, with women in the game, specifically in officiating. Um, when you see people like Tori Penso and the opportunities that she's had created solely by by hard work. How gratifying is it for for you? Oh, it, it's it's beyond gratifying. I I don't know what word I can use to encapsulate it for the fact that, you know, it, during my tenure as refereeing, I stepped off the FIFA panel in 2019. And if you would have asked me at that time, would women be refereeing uh, in men's uh, competitions in FIFA in you know major league soccer, I would have said we are still very far away. So one of the things I do want to tip off is it takes two parts for specifically not just women in the referee side, but women in sports is that you need two people. You need uh, someone at the table who's advocating and championing and opening those doors. And then you need that person who's ready to step through that door and keep that door open based on performance and quality and I have to nod my hat off to Carrie Seitz, uh, most decorated uh, USA referee uh, and FIFA referee around the world for a number of World Cups and Olympics that she attended and she's the one who really opened the door and you know was eye-opening the other day I was talking to her and since 2017 there was zero women in FIFA competitions male FIFA uh, male competitions and now since sweat 2017 women are in every male competition around the world for FIFA and that really leads the light in the campaign for not just the world but importantly for the domestic league and ensuring that we don't care the gender all we care is you're qualified and you are able to do the job so uh, hats off to Carrie Seitz and hats off to Tori Penso because everything she said is true having three babies coming back from it uh, passing the men's fitness test to be able to step on that field and crush it from an officiating standpoint uh, there's a lot that is not seen uh, that um, you see the tip of the iceberg but you don't see the base of it I love it Christina I have to ask Nico and I were actually just talking to that point about why isn't it just normal that there's the just referee female referees all over the map officiating these games. What else has to happen to normalize women in these spaces refereeing? Because, you know, yeah. you're right, there needs to be a seat at the table, someone advocating for you and just to be qualified. But why, why don't we see that more and what needs to happen for that to be more prevalent? I think it's kind of we track quite a bit. I think we're a little bit behind when we talk about women professional soccer players, right? It's never been a right, but it's been a fight to play the game. Um, kind of the same thing for referees. Uh, you have the one, the financial investment, just refereeing in general. Are we investing enough to develop referees at that level? Uh, so when you're in a room and you are the only female and there are 50 guys in that room, right? Uh, there, You look around and no one looks like you, right? So you say, is this even possible, right? My instructors don't look like me. My colleagues don't look like me. So that can be very daunting in that respect. Um, but second of all, it's that, it's that understanding that while you climb the ladder, right, there is no 
significant financial incentive, right? I'm a lawyer, so sometimes I crunch my time on a billable hour. And if I crunch my time on a billable hour when I was coming up the ranks, you know, I actually lost money on that respect. So um, there's kind of a twofold on it. One, you have to have the passion, um, but then you also have to have the ability for people to open doors, the financial investment in the developing of officials. And then just truly for the longest time, people would say, they're not ready yet for you as a woman referee. And many of us who are available and ready at those time periods that weren't that long ago, we were like, what do you mean they're not ready for us? Right. So there's a huge cultural change. And, you know, we see it being broken around. And as our U.S. women's national team broke uh, barriers and equal pay, you know, they champion the cause. You know, we as referees have to keep our mouth shut and we can't advocate for ourselves. So it takes something where either someone who is at the table, who's typically not a referee, whether that's a, a coach or a player or someone like me who went rogue and <laughs> started speaking out uh, it takes us in order to be able to advocate so that we can get that investment and really people see our perspective and what we're trying to do and develop Christina no doubt important what Tori did with Major League Soccer and of course the uh, the Women's World Cup final how about moments like Rebecca Welch cutting her teeth in the championship in England and getting that opportunity just before Christmas I think she did her second game this weekend how 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 important is that to advancing, uh, getting women to continue to take those steps? Yeah, you just have to really take a look at, you know, what is, you know, the Premier League? It's one of the most profitable uh, leagues in the world, right? I'm sitting here, we're talking about, uh, it's a diploma in law. So we're talking about commercial rights. We're talking about finances. We're talking about what is really what turns the head, right? And Premier League is that league around the world that turns its head from the profitability standpoint. So for someone like Howard Webb, who used to be the head of, you know, pro here in Major League Soccer and really opened those doors for us as well. So it's not just women that are getting to the tables and open doors, but it's our allies. Now that he's over there for PGMO, he sees the same, you know, you just have to be qualified. So for him to be able to advocate and champion behind closed doors to say, Rebecca Welch is ready, she's qualified and she can do the games as we have seen, right? Um, for someone to open the door in one of the most commercially you know, profitable leagues to entrust that into the hands, uh, that itself is, you know, it, it, it breaks glass ceilings that we didn't even know existed. Uh, and it really does lead the tale that nobody else has an excuse to say, oh, well, you know, we can't put a female referee because what happens if she messes the game? You know, it's uh, none of the other leagues can say that it's not a possibility anymore. Hey, Christina, since you're there, do you mind talking to some really important people and just just like incept them about changing the handball rule back to <laughs> deliberate or not when times were a little bit more simple. So when the next IFAB meeting comes around, we have more clarity. <laughs> I uh, may or may not, off the record, have a meeting with someone. So uh, I will see what I can do. We are staying, I'm pretty sure, over a, a, a traditional Swiss uh, dinner of uh, fondue. We will uh, have a conversation about handling and VAR. So. Nice. Wow. wow. In Christine, I trust. <laughs> Nico Let's go resist. back to deliberate. <laughs> oh, Christina, um, you are such a badass. You inspire me every single day. Thank you so oh. much for all you do. And yeah, just keep keep breaking those glass ceilings, lady. <laughs>